Shalom everyone, I'm Amir Tsarfati and I'm here from Connect from Galilee, Israel. And this is our first show of Explore the Bible. We've been waiting for this for a long time. There were so many delays uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure that the enemy didn't want us to talk about the Bible and it definitely doesn't want people to know about the Bible. And this is exactly why we want to talk about the Bible, explain about the Bible, teach the Bible, and see people grow in their knowledge of God's Word. And, um, you know, a lot of people are afraid of the Bible. A lot of people don't know what the Bible is. And I thought it would be very good not only to uh, teach them, but also to remind ourselves what the Bible is all about so we can be able to uh, explain to others in a much more intelligent and simple way. Um, and of course, this is also a way to strengthen our faith as well. Together with me today is Dr. Rick Yon from Parker, Colorado. Rick, shalom, my friend. How are you? I am doing quite well, Amir. Boy, do we ever go back many, many years. I think we went back Go back to what, 2006, when we were both very, very young. I, I think I was I think ten. You, I was ten years old. No, at 2006. I think you were actually 32 years old, somewhere oh. around there. And uh, when you got off the bus, and I came out of the airport, and you come running over to me, your arms out, and you say, "I'm a mirror so funny. I'm your guide." And I thought, "Man, we're <laughs> in trouble right now." <laughs> oh, you're not. And I thought, well, not as bad as I thought it would be. Then we went to the next stop, and, well, it's getting a little bit better. And I think by the third stop, you and I are in the front seat just laughing and talking, right. and I think we became great friends at that point. And then <laughs> at the end of that, you invited your wife and I and uh, – uh, Jason Elam, former kicker of the Broncos, and his wife Tammy invited us out to a Moroccan restaurant, I think it was. I have no idea what we ate, but boy, we were just laughing and laughing, and you were dropping these one liners, and tears were coming out of our eyes. We were laughing so hard. So it was a wonderful, a wonderful time there in 2006. And in fact, I liked it so much that in 2008, I said, I want a mirror Sarfati. And that's where our friendship started. Yes. I remember that tour very well. And again, I remember Jason Elam there with his wife and a few of his children. Remember, of course, your beloved wife, Linda, that went to be with the Lord uh, less than a year ago, um, uh, which I miss a lot. And I'm sure you do, too. After how many years of marriage, uh, Rick? 61 years of marriage, but we knew each other for 70 years. She just came out of junior high school. <laughs> so, wow. Amazing. It was yeah. time. Yeah. I can't yeah. wait to see her again, by the way. Amen. Yeah. But the Lord has been so good. There are two passages of Scripture that uh, really mean a lot to me. When the Lord took Linda, I just looked at up into heaven and said, Lord, it's just you and I now. And I want to learn everything I can from you, because the Bible is now going to be very, very personal to me. And in Psalm 3.3, I love this passage because it says, but you are a shield around me. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. You are a shield around me, so I have nothing to fear. You are my glory, so I don't need glory from man. Yeah. And I just love the fact that, that God is a God who, who knows us because he created us, and he is our protector, he is our provider. And then I, I go to Isaiah chapter 60 or 26, and it says in verse 12, Lord, you established peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you 
have done for us. Amen. All that we have accomplished, you, O oh God, have done for us. Hallelujah. So we can't take any glory in things that we have, have done. Yes. He has given us the gifts. He has given us the connections. He has given us the motivators in our lives. He has brought about the events to bring these wonderful works together for his glory. Yes. And so even though I don't have my spouse with me anymore, I do have my Lord with me. Amen. Amen. And I think that's Amen. why we struck such a friendship. I always saw in you, besides a friend, a mentor, and also someone who's humble enough to understand that all the great knowledge you you have in you is is really from God, and you always gave God the glory. And this is why I think you're the perfect person to help us understand what the Bible is all about, because, you know, we don't need puff professors uh, thinking that their, you know, their wisdom can, can, you know, explain everything. When I mean, what we really want is to, the Bible to explain the Bible and the Bible to explain what the Bible is all about. And someone like you that uh, you've been teaching for so many decades on the Bible. And, you know, a lot of people are, are watching us uh, with this book, uh, holding the book, opening the book, reading from the book. And, and to be honest with you, Millions around the world are asking, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? Uh, I mean, for the Jewish people, when you say the word Bible, it means one thing. For the Christian, when you say the word Bible, it means another thing. Um, for uh, the pagan, uh, you know, they will quote many things, and for them, that's the Bible. And, uh, you know, so, so the question is, when, when someone asks you, what is the Bible? What are the essential truths that uh, you can rely on when you answer this question in the most simple way? Well, and very simply, it is, it is a compass. It is a compass to direct us through the jungle of life. I mean, when you think of the ungodliness throughout the world, it is the Word of God to help us live a godly life in an ungodly world. Wow. Because Same. people do not know, with everything that's going on, with the, with the wars and just the immorality and, and, and throughout the world, you see chaos rather than order. You see hate rather than love. You see war rather than peace. What is the cause of all this? And the Bible tells us what the cause is and also tells us what the solution is. Amen. Yeah, even and so as you're right. You're right. It gives us the answers to so many of the questions. Even yesterday, one of uh, my team members here, in light of so much that is going on in Israel nowadays and you know so many threats that are being thrown in the air to annihilate Israel and, and he, he, he you know he was frank with me he told me look I'm under a lot of anxiety and stress and I said to him look you know it, it, you, you can be under stress and you can have anxiety but remember one thing at the end of the day in the very end of the book we're still there our enemies are not so if you take that and now use that as your compass, that mere fact that biblically we're supposed to be here when our enemies are not, this alone can give you comfort and strength to go through this situation right now. Um, and so, yeah, so again... Again, the question uh, we we're trying to ask on this program today is, what is the Bible? And of course, digging deeper now that we know what the Bible is as a compass to live godly life in a very ungodly world, what are some of the very interesting facts that our viewers may not be aware of regarding the authors, 
the content, and etc. Well, a lot of people say that there are 40 authors of Scripture. Uh, How many? I disagree. <laughs> 40 authors. And I disagree. There is one author, and there are 40 writers. Okay. God the Father is the author. He is the one who has revealed himself to us. He has revealed ourselves to us also. And Jesus Christ is the central figure from Genesis through Revelation. You know, a lot of people think that Jesus begins in the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> he really begins in the book of Genesis. In the very and first chapter. That central figure, yeah, throughout. And then it's the Holy Spirit who is the guide. He, he is the one who guided the writers. He is the one that oversaw the writings. And, you know, the Bible tells us that the scriptures are inspired by God, not the writers. Now, when we read the scriptures, we can be inspired by the scriptures, but it's the scriptures that were inspired by God. And we can get into a little bit more at later on. And then God used man as the instrument to actually do the writing using their personalities, using their educational backgrounds, using their writing styles. But it's the Holy Spirit that superintended that whole process. So, so yeah. this book, God is the chief author. Forty different people were used by him to write an inspired word that the Holy Spirit inspired. And God used ordinary people with human uh, uh, nature to yeah. be able to write the Word of God inspired by the Spirit of God. Yeah, the very same way he used a human being, Mary, to bring into this world a perfect child. So did he use 40 different writers to bring into this world a perfect book wow. with the wisdom of God to help us understand who he is, who we are, and how we can have a personal relationship with our creator made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Rick, we've identified four unique claims of the Bible. And I know that uh, people need to know that uh, we created a web page that will include not only this program, but also a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation that will go deeper into everything we're talking about and also allow you to put your question there so we can uh, be able to answer in future uh, programs. But again, four claims of the Bible. So what do we mean by those four, which is revelation, inspiration, inerrancy, and uh, authoritative? Tell us more about that. Well, revelation is that God is a God who wanted to know his creation and wanted his creation to know him. Now, how can we know God if God doesn't make himself known to us? So he has made his, himself known to us in a variety of ways. First of all, in creation. The Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And no matter where a person lives on planet Earth, he can look up into the heavens and he sees form. He sees God's wonderful creation. And behind that creation, there has to be a creator. Behind that grand design, there has to be a grand designer. So he makes himself known to all mankind through creation. Uh -huh. But he's also made himself known to us through our conscience. The Bible tells us that uh, even the Gentiles have a law within themselves. So we know right from wrong. 
Now, that might vary from society to society, but we know that to go out and kill somebody is not right. You don't have many people raising their hand. No, there are some who would raise their hand and say it's all right to murder, but not many would do that because we are all aware are taking something that belongs to another for ourselves. So there's a law within us. We call it conscience. And then God has made himself known to us also through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were created by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And then that word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen, God. Has seen the Father. Mm -hmm. And then... Through the scriptures, and the Bible tells us that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. We often forget that part. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness so that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for good works. Hmm. So as we are in the word, God has given us everything that we need to live a godly life. I mean, he has given us his Holy Spirit. He has given us the scriptures. He has given us the body of Christ. And uh, it, we, we are so well equipped. It's just that we don't know the equipment that we have. Just like the Apostle Paul said, what advantage is it being a Jew? Ah, much in every much way. Much in every way. For they have the very words of God. Wow. The very oracles of God. And anything we need to know about God is revealed to us in the scriptures. So that's the revelation aspect. He has made himself known in those four areas or those four ways. But the scriptures are also inspired by God. And uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, I had just quoted earlier, that it is an equipping book. And it's an equipping book. That, that's an interesting word, equip. It's actually a, a nautical term that means to mend broken bones. It's a military word to equip or to outfit an army. And this word means for us to be equipped with our spiritual gifts, with the Word of God, with the Holy Spirit, with the body of Christ, to do the things God has called us to do. Hmm. And when you think of the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life, we have so much. We, we don't I think that's, that, the... I think that's an aspect often ignored by people, or or totally disregarded by people. They don't understand that apart from the Bible, which they can look at as a book, there is the Holy Spirit, that unless you have that one, then the Bible is only a book for you. That's right. He is the illuminator. Amen. He helps us to understand. And when I think in terms of the Holy Spirit, first of all, He is the one who regenerates us. He is the one that opens our eyes to be able to see the scriptures, opens our ears to be able to hear. I mean, think of the many times you may have sat in a church service and 
you know, you liked the sermon and it was okay. But one day, all of a sudden, that hit home. And you realize he's talking to me. To me. I'm the one who has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I want that Savior. I want to know more about Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He regenerates us. Yes. And then when we receive Christ as our Savior, he comes and dwells within us. And that's the difference between the Old Testament believers and New Testament believers. In the Old Testament, he came and went. He was he came yeah. and he and, came upon Saul. He came upon yeah. someone and he could leave him. And that's why David cried, Oh Lord, do not remove your spirit Amen. from me. Exactly. We don't have to pray that prayer. No. Jesus said, He is with you, he will be in you. In you. And then he baptizes us into the body of Christ. When we become part, when we receive Christ, we come, become part of the church, part of the body of Christ. Mm. And he goes beyond that. He seals us. And he is the seal. The Father seals us with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We belong to him. Hmm. And then he sanctifies us. And that word sanctify just means to be set apart. Yes. And to become more and more transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that there are three tenses of sanctification. We have been sanctified when we receive Christ. We are daily being sanctified as he reveals sin in our lives and we confess it and we are growing in Christ. And one day we shall be glorified, completely sanctified, yeah. where there will be no sin. When we are no longer in this sinful body and receive body. Our, our glorified body. And then he gifts us. He gives us these special abilities that we love to do, but we don't know their gifts. There are things that we do naturally and often think, well, everybody can do this. <laughs> I guarantee I do a lot of gifted people and I don't have them as gifts. And uh, the gift I feel that God has given to me is a gift of teaching, but there are a lot of gifts I do not have. In fact, yesterday I had gentlemen right here in this office getting everything set up for uh, today, and I was just amazed sitting back, seeing how each one used his gift to get this office all ready for today. That's the body of Christ at work, using their giftedness. Yes. Well, there's so much more we can talk about the Holy yeah. Spirit, but we're talking about the Word of God. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I think that we're going to have our completely separate program on the Holy Spirit because, I, again, as I said, I know a lot of people that profess to be Christians, that profess to be reading the Bible, that profess to say prayers, say prayers. But I know for a fact they don't they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't they don't even know him because you can tell by the things that they're dealing with that they're uh, you know that they're consumed by. Uh, you can tell that there's no way that person can have the Holy Spirit when all he does is things that are against the Word of God. And so so again, a lot of people are religious people. They, 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 they think they are born Christians. They think that the Bible is a book we can read from to, to just check the box, say a prayer, or go to uh, some service, or give our checks. But again, the game changer, the, the most important thing, the one that is making us today since 2,000 years ago, completely different than any living being before that is the fact that now we can actually have the Holy Spirit in us and we can be sealed with it as a down payment, as a guarantee 
for already our redemption. Um, yeah, that word that word guarantee is an important word. Arabon. It's the Greek. Arabon. Arabon. And in Greek, it was actually used of an engagement ring. And so I see the Holy Spirit as Jesus' engagement ring to his bride that one day will be consummated. Amazing. That's that's a beautiful analogy. Um, there's a, another thing that a lot of people are, you know, I'm, I'm very active on social media, and, and especially when you go to realms that are consumed by non-believers, such as Twitter, X of today, and others. One of the things that you can tell that bothers people is the fact that the Bible is something that men wrote. Uh, and and, and they, 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 they basically quick to reject the Bible because it was written by a man or men in, in light of 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 and other passages. Can you maybe help our listeners understand the reliability of the Bible? Because again, we, we said God is the main author. He used 40 different authors, but Talk, let's talk about the reliability of the Scriptures. Well, the, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit moved the men as they wrote, using their personalities, their backgrounds, their writing styles. The writing styles in, in the uh, different literary styles are amazing throughout Scripture. So it's not like a robotic where they just sat down and said, all right, Lord, what do I write next? They saw needs, and the Holy Spirit moved in their lives to meet those needs, to address, the, like yes. Paul. The church at Corinth was writing questions to him. <laughs> and so in 1 Corinthians, he says, now concerning this, now concerning this, yes. now concerning this. So these writers were writing to meet needs. And you, you think of Daniel meeting the need of a pagan king saying, I have this dream and my wise men cannot interpret it for me and they won't tell me what my dream was. And Daniel says, no man can tell you your dream, but there is a God in heaven yes. who reveals dreams. And this was your dream. And this is the interpretation of that dream. And all of a sudden, this young Daniel is elevated in the eyes of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. And then you see him dealing with other kings throughout that period. So it's the Holy Spirit revealing to these prophets what is going to be taking place. Now, there is no other religious or holy book that was ever written that has fulfilled prophecy where you can go back historically and say, on this day, that prophecy was fulfilled. And yet, there are over 300 prophecies concerning Christ, and hundreds of these have already been fulfilled. When Micah said that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, he didn't say uh, it was a place something like Bethlehem. No, when Jesus was born, he was born in Bethlehem. Now, that was prophesied hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Likewise, Isaiah talks about a man named Cyrus, who was going to be a king. And that was over 100 years before he was even born. And so, fulfilled prophecy is one of the greatest evidences of the authority of the Word of God, that this, no man could have ever come up with something like that. And that authority and it, gives us reliability. And, and you think of all the manuscripts that we have. I mean, in the New Testament alone, we have almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts that you can, can compare with one manuscript to another and get back to very close to the very original writings of these yes. uh, writers. 
So, so you, and then so the authentic it, it, it so it proves the authenticity of right. the Bible and thus reliability as well. And when it comes to archaeology, <laughs> what other religious books are there out there that you can take an archaeologist and go and find exactly what was written thousands of years ago? And right now you go to Jerusalem and in the Gavadi parking lot, <laughs> you were back 3,000 years. Mm-hmm. And you can see, no, Israel is not occupying someone else's land. They are occupying their own land that goes back over 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Look, uh, to be honest with you, the Bible is one of the, the most amazing tools to explain today's reality and to explain today's uh you know, events, current events. Um, and, you know, we can, for example, if, if you brought up the, the issue of Israel, you know, we can argue about so many things. But when you bring the, the, uh, the whole argument of we are here because this is where our forefathers were and we actually can prove it, I think this is where the debate ends. I think that that's where the other side has nothing against uh, to counterbalance that one because they have nothing that goes back beyond a, a hundred and something years ago. And, you know, there is no roots there that is, as, as ours. And our roots are not even based on what we originally wanted. I mean, I'm, I'm always... I'm always telling people I don't think I don't think Abraham wanted this place and and I'm not even sure uh, the the people of Israel wanted to return to this place but I I am pretty sure God wanted them to return and that's that's the most important thing and which is also why yeah go ahead leave the place where you are which is present day Iraq and go to the place I will show you and then the book of Hebrews says that Abraham left, not knowing where he was going. Exactly, exactly. And did not land of Israel. And 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 that's the point. We did not covet um, somebody else's land. Uh, we were actually brought to that place, and we were told, "Take it. That's the land I want you to have." And and an interesting thing is when he brought us back. He said, I'm bringing you back to the land that I have given you. And everywhere you are outside of this land is actually profanity. And it profanes my name. Because then people ask themselves, aren't these the people of God? What are they doing away from the land of God? So, you know, the word of God to me, to me personally, explains my daily reality today it, it's not a church service on sunday or a synagogue service on shabbat it's my day-to-day -day reality i have to deal with why am i here every day because every day can you imagine in america there will be 15 enemies around you trying to always attack you and take it from you because they think it's theirs and the whole world helps them with echoing propaganda that has no base. And all you have, all you have is this book. Because, because of this book, you ended up coming to Israel. Because of this book, we can have on our Declaration of Independence that this is the land of our fathers. And because... Of that, the Balfour Declaration could say that this is the homeland of the Jewish people. Not because of anything else. I, I think that if you take the Bible away from the equation, we lose our argument yeah. over this land. That's it. Yeah. And they don't realize also the enemies of Israel are fighting a losing battle. Exactly. God told Abraham. 
Those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. And there are a lot of curses going out right now with what's yeah. going on here in the Middle East. I know. And, uh, and you know, it's not easy to live in a place where the whole world every day claims is not yours. <laughs> and you yeah. know it's yours. And you know that you can prove that it's yours because of the Bible and because of history and archaeology that can prove you that everything you know that we find is the things that were written even earlier than that and it proves that it ours you know uh dr rick pastor rick um the concept of dual authorship is a key thing when we uh, you know come to understand the greater context of the bible what is it that this whole dual authorship not just God working with man. It is God choosing 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years, using three different languages on three different continents to give to mankind a compass for everyday living. I mean, there's no other book that can make that claim. No other book that will clarify who this creator is. No other book provides a God who loves you, a God who cares for you, a God who wants a personal relationship with you. There's, there's no other book that says, with everything going on in the world, let me tell you what is going on in the world and how you can interpret what is going on in the world. Because what I see going on in the world does not surprise me at all. It doesn't surprise me because of the Word of God. It tells me that in the latter days, these are the things that are going to take place and they are going to be escalating. It's like a woman with birth pangs, and the closer you come to the delivery, the faster and more rapid they are. And we're just seeing all these events taking place. I mean, just think of the Ezekiel 38-39 war that the prophet Ezekiel is talking about. And now you see an alignment of Russia and Turkey and Iran I mean, these are the three biggies, and uh, Turkey even talking about uh, joining to invade Israel. Now, that, <laughs> that is something that's special. So the alignment of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is before our very eyes. And if that's the case, well, I must say that the rapture of the church is even closer. Amen. Amen. And again, our hope to be taken out of here is also anchored in scriptures. It's not anchored in in somebody's late uh, theology or late ideas. It's it's from scriptures, and it's based on what was revealed to the Apostle Paul already in his lifetime, but it's also based on what was revealed to the prophets of Israel even before that, and it follows suits um, examples from even the book of Genesis. So, I mean, it goes all the way back then. If, if somebody could be raptured while he was living, as he was walking in the book of Genesis, I don't see a problem uh, for that to happen to us, uh, especially when we know that as things uh, escalate, um, we need to be out of here before some someone else is making his grand entrance into uh, our world. Um, what a privilege of this generation. Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, I've said that so many times, even to my own children. I don't think we even understand how blessed we are to live in a generation that could see in his lifetime more prophecies fulfilled than any other generation since the first century combined. All 
Um, and I think that um, for us to not dream about living in Israel, but to be born here, for us not to dream about having our own country, but to live in it, uh, I don't take it for granted. I'm the first generation of my family that was already born back in the land after 2,000 years. I am from the tribe of Judah. I can't believe I've even saying those things. And here I am. And Amir? Yeah. I sp- yeah. There, there was no Israel when I was born. See? I was 11 years old. <laughs> wow. I was 11 years old when Israel was born. So back in my Bible... It was Palestine. There is no Israel. Israel. And, and, and even then, nation, yeah, that is fulfilled. Amazing. A nation was born in one day. Can a nation be born, be born at once? And, 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 you know, May 14, 1948. So, look, the, the last thing I want to ask you for this program, and again, we, every few weeks we're going to have this program and we're going to go deeper and and, and broader in so many different aspects of the Bible. We're going to talk about the different uh, uh, parts of the Bible. We're going to talk about different translations of the Bible. We're going to talk about so many things uh, because we truly want people to understand what the Bible is all about. But, uh, you know, saying the Bible is perfect, uh, namely without error, doesn't make it perfect when we say it. Uh, so what evidence do we have that the Bible really is perfect and complete? Because the author is perfect and complete. Amen. So in the original writings, the Holy Spirit superintended the writers so that what they wrote was without error. It's it's the theological term inerrancy. It just means there is there are no errors in what they wrote. And so, as I said before, if God can take a sinful woman and produce a perfect human being, Jesus Christ, He can take sinful writers and produce a perfect book Amen. without error. Yes. Uh, you know, I am I'm always amazed at the, how man is always engaged in, 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 in some mad race to prove the Bible wrong. And they always make fool of themselves. You know, especially when it comes to scientists who try to prove that there was no creation. And so they've been working so hard on recreating that which brought to life this world and they even have a whole theory of how this world evolved but they're just they're lacking only one little thing the basic <laughs> and which by the way everything crumbles when that happens because science has to be accurate from the very basic of it uh, so, you know, it's interesting. I think you need more faith to believe that the Bible is not true than, uh, than to simply accept the fact that the, what we see, what we live, what we surrounded by is, uh, you know, everything God said that the world is going to be like and look like. And now we have a choice to read his word, understand how to live godly life in ungodly world. Or to give in to the terrible way that Satan wants us to be in a fallen world that is doomed to be destroyed one day. And to place ourselves under the authority of the Word of God. Amen. I just want to encourage those of you who are viewing, accept it. Accept this book as the Word of God, because it works. It works. Yeah. God has given me so much peace in my life uh, in this past year, and he has revealed himself time and time again, not appearing in person or anything, but appearing through the Scriptures. Mm. And I apply the Scriptures to my everyday living, and 
it works. Amen. The Bible is quick, yes. living, and powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword. Amen. Dividing asunder of joints and marrow, of our thoughts and the very intentions of our heart. Amen. Take it at, at place. Yes. Well, this brings to an end our first uh, program of Explore the Bible. And again, folks, on our website, we're going to have a, a dedicated page uh, for Explore the Bible, where we're going to not only place the video, but also a PowerPoint presentation with uh, everything you need to know about what we talked about in this program in much deeper way. And also a section where you can leave us in a question so we can try and answer that in the next show. Pastor Rick, Dr. Rick, my friend Rick, thank you very much. Um, you would do me an honor if you could uh, conclude this uh, uh, program with a prayer. Will you? I'd love to. Our Father and our God, what a privilege we have being able to hold in our in our hands, the very words of God. Thank you for making yourself known to us. Thank you for showing us how we can have that personal relationship with you. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit, who enlightens us as we read the scriptures. Thank you for being with us at this very moment. Touch our hearts, touch our minds, Open us up to the teaching of your spirit so that your spirit ministers to our spirit, that we might walk in your power. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you, folks, uh, for being with us today. This was our first Explore the Bible program. We're looking forward for more. We'll let you know when the next one is on our website and social media as well. And Dr. Rick will be with us uh, every program. And again, we are going to have a dedicated section in our website where you can click and go and see not only the program but also a PowerPoint presentation with much deeper approach to what we talked about as well as a section where you can leave your question so we can try and answer them next time. And until then, thank you Dr. Rick. Thank you guys for thank being you. with us. Thank you. Shalom and God bless you from Galilee. Thank you.